Good evening, everyone. All right, that sounds a little better. I know it's the end of the week. It's been a long week. I want to really thank everyone for coming. Um, I do need the mic because we're recording it. Thank you, though, Beverly. Appreciate you, as always. Um, yes, I know. It might, I'll, I'll hold it a little further away so it doesn't deafen you. Um, good. Um, but I sincerely want to thank everyone for coming. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge a couple of people that have uh, joined us this evening, um, starting with our administrator, Ms. Shakima Jones. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Yes, stand up and wave. Um, we also have Commissioner J.P. Oriel and uh, Commissioner Derek Gabriel from uh, DPNR and Public Works with us. And we have Mr. Salazar. One more time. Shazer, sorry. Uh, with Senator Bolquist's office and Mrs. Hodge, she's outside on a, a phone call. Uh, anybody else I'm missing? And more importantly, our St. John community. Thank you, thank you, thank you again for coming. Um, this has been a, for me, uh, at least a historic week. Um, and I just wanted to come up and kind of manage everyone's expectations um, and kind of clear up any misconceptions you may have had about what this process was. Um, I want to thank the folks from Horsley Witten and Dover Cole for coming down and taking down all of your concerns, comments, and everything. And they're the ones that are going to pretty much show us what we all have been telling them in a way that allows us to move forward in a community. Now, we can't promise that any of what you're going to see tonight is going to get done, right? And it's okay to laugh. It's okay because, you know, if it wasn't for hurricanes, we wouldn't see a lot of development. So at this point, we're using this opportunity, though, to create a map. If anybody gets in a car and you don't know where you're going, the first thing you're going to refer to is a map, right? It kind of outlines the way to get there. And so basically what we're giving you tonight is a rough draft of everything that they heard this week in our between the community walks and the design studio times that everybody came in. And I thank everyone that just took the time out of their day to stop in and give them the information that, that was needed. Um, from what they told me, that this was a very um, energizing participation by the community. And they got a chance to really see what St. John is truly made of. And that's us, the people. So, you know, whether you were born here, migrated, came, it doesn't matter. My vision of a, a, a person that's considered a local is somebody that gives back to their community in one way or the other. That doesn't just take. And everybody that's in here, I can look at and see at different times where they have given to this community, whether it's talent, whether it's their time, but something. And so we have a very special community. And so now we're going to have something as a community that said, look, this is what we came together and said we would like to see. So whether it's government funding that becomes available to execute that vision, or we work together to raise money or attract private funding to get it done, we at least have a vision of what, what we as a community would like to see. And so, just to, I want to make it clear, a lot of, all the senators were invited. Everybody that can make something happen was invited. Now, some came and some didn't. And I can't judge the ones that didn't. But I just want you to look around the room because these are the people that made the commitment to do what they needed to do to make this community a better place. And so, with that being said, again, I just want to welcome you. Thank you. Um, before I, I turn it over to the next person, I want to acknowledge Megan Enright from Love City Strong, the executive director. I'm, you know, I'm just a board member, and, um, you know, yes, please stand up. Um, I just call, and I'm like, hey, Megan, I think we, we should try this, and, and you know, it, it happens. Um, but none of this can't really happen. I want to acknowledge one last person before I, I pass the mic, and... Um, he joined us about a year and a half ago, two years, and um, has become a very close friend of mine and a confidant and somebody that when I'm frustrated, I can call 
And he always brings me back to what this mission or what, I, what we signed up for is, right? And that's Mr. Rory Melvin, who is a consultant with uh, Love City Strong and the Secunda Family Foundation. Um, but he has come in, and he was the one that said, look, let's reach out to these folks and get them down here because they've done it before. And so I want you guys to understand that while we don't always see the immediate change, there are people that's working in our best interest to make things better for us, for our seniors, for our youth, for our entrepreneurs. We have right now Walden Gill right here, Walden Gill. He's going to UVI to study engineering. Right? So once we have this stuff up, this is who we got to call and say, well, and how close are you to finishing that degree? We got to build this stuff. Right? So this is what a community is about. And again, I thank you. I'm not going to take much longer. Um, Margaret, thank you again for giving me the opportunity to welcome everybody. And again, thank you guys for participating. This is your reality, not just mine. This is ours as a community. And so... We'll, we're going to use this to bring us together and keep us together. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces. We've enjoyed getting to know you all this past week, and we feel honored to be a part of this planning process. As Ian was saying, this here tonight is a draft plan. This is actually the first time anyone in this room has seen this presentation. We just finished it about mm, three minutes ago. So I appreciate your patience. I appreciate that. I wanted to be um, transparent about that as we've been all week because I want you to know that what you see this evening is a draft. And so what we're doing tonight by gathering and sharing what we've learned from one another this week is to continue to get that constant feedback from one another to make sure that the plan is on the right track. So. I want to thank you all for being here tonight. My name is Margaret Flippin. I'm a town planner with Dover Colon Partners, and we're honored to be a part of the team with Horsley Witten, led, excuse me, led by Nate Kelly. And Horsley Witten focuses on deep green infrastructure and sustainability for planning better places. And so we feel very fortunate. They're also the leaders in the territory-wide plan, the comprehensive land use and water plan that'll be going on in the territory as well. And this plan for Cruise Bay fits within that larger framework. But what you all are doing this week is really setting the bar high for the rest of the territory to really get out and participate in the comprehensive planning process. This plan itself is focused on Cruise Bay, but I want you to know it goes within that larger process. So you all are really setting the bar for what's to come. Also with Nate is John Ford and Ellen Bigert. <laughs> and then with our team from Dover Colon Partners, we're town planners and urban designers that focus on walkability and building complete, com complete communities, focusing on preservation of those places as well as great streets and walkable places. We're led by Victor Dover, principal with our firm, also the writer of the book, Great Streets. <laughs> so, as well as Amy Groves, principal as well with our firm, and Amy led our efforts on St. Thomas with the town's blueprint back in 2010 in a very similar planning process as this. So we feel really privileged to work in the territory. And it's exciting to see in St. Thomas with Veterans Drive that came out of the town's blueprint and then was implemented as a public infrastructure project along the waterfront. We also have Kenneth, Kenneth Garcia, a lead designer with our firm, Eric Pate, and Robin Crowder. And so I want to introduce, I know many of you all have met this week, but I just, at the end, we're going to kind of get to some questions and answers, and I just wanted you to, to get to know everybody. So here's what we're going to do this tonight. We're going to kind of go through quickly what we learned this week. I see a lot of familiar faces. You've heard a lot of what's been going on this week. Um, and then get into the plan concepts, which once again are marked draft. So as many of us have sat around tables together and looked at these maps and looked at images from the past and thought about plans for the future, just to orient you all from the ferry dock leading down Prince Street, the National Historic District, as well as up towards Veterans Circle, and right here where we are right now in the Sprout School. So, oh, not on my mic. Sorry. Um, the schedule from the week. Um, it's been really incredible, and I can't um, say enough about how pleased we are 
with the level of participation this week, our process is, um, it's, it's what we live for, it's designing in public. So when we arrived last Saturday, um, we arrived basically with base maps, just maps that show the existing conditions. And what we were able to work on together this week was ideas for the area. So before we get started on getting into the plan concepts, we want to do a, a quick phone poll. If you have your phone with you, um, and if you don't mind participating, if you don't have a phone, you can always reach to a neighbor. But if you, I think many of you have done this from Monday night, if you can please text 22333 and in the message, Dover Cole 516. And if anybody has any problems with that, just raise your hand and one of our team members can help you. But um, many of you may have this set up on your phone from Monday night, if you don't mind. We're gonna, throughout the evening, ask a couple of different questions. And what this polling does is it provides the instant feedback. So when you answer, it's going to show up on the screen. So we can kind of see, we can kind of gauge the room and see where everybody's coming from. Everybody feel good about that? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead with our first question. Did you attend the walking tour on Sunday? So if the answer is yes, you can type in A and hit send. If the answer is no, you can type in B and hit send. Maybe, maybe you were here, maybe you weren't. It was a little hot that day. We had around 20 folks with us and uh, it was really awesome, but uh, it was a great tour of town. All right, next one. Did you attend the hands-on session here on Monday night? We had a great crowd working together on maps. A for yes, B for no. Doing good? Okay. Great. All right, we're going to go to the next one. Did you stop by and see us at the Temporary Design Studio? I know many of you were even just going to check your mail and you stopped in and that was some of our favorite um, favorite visits in addition to just everyone coming in. It was just great to see just everyday daily life in town. So if you stop by, A for yes, B for no. So this is a really great exercise just for us to understand participation and especially you kind of see as the week goes on, you all did a really wonderful job of spreading the word and getting your friends and your neighbors and your relatives to also participate in the process because what we really want is this plan to be community driven and you all act as authors of that plan. So, um, okay, so most of us have some um, acknowledgement of what was going on this week, but we can also just sort of recap together. And many of you can tell these stories. We had a wonderful walking tour led by Kurt. We hit some main sites throughout Cruise Bay Town. It was a little bit hot, but we did it. We all got our hats to keep cool in the sun. But what we did along the walking tour was sort of stopped and actually talked face to face in the exact locations about what were some possibilities, what are some visions for the future, especially of some of the government property sites that could undergo redevelopment in time. But it was a really wonderful focus to look at the history of the place, as well as coming together Monday night in this room. I can't believe how fast this week has gone by. It's been really invigorating and energizing to work on the plan together. But coming together and working in small groups, we did a phone poll like one we just did, where we asked one word about Cruise Bay today. The larger words are the words that were most suggested. So congested, congested, crowded, rundown, and then getting to in your vision. So walkable, accessible, community, sustainable. So these were, were the polling similar to what we just did. So working in small groups, and what was really great was as the evening went on, and we like to say argue with your pen or argue with your pencil, and so that way, you were sharing ideas as a group and you start to see some common themes and some similar ideas emerge that maybe you may not have had a similar thought and you're like, and so what we were doing is sort of taking those ideas and working them into a draft plan. So lots of good Crayola markers, working together, and then pre presenting ideas to the overall group. We had seven tables and basically what started to happen once the first table went, the following tables were like, hey, wait, you know, we had a similar idea. 
and part of that is really exciting because it starts to show consensus building. It starts to show some common interest and some common themes for the area. So it was really wonderful to have community members present, sharing ideas, pointing out and actually drawing items on the map for improvements. These are just some close-ups of some of those maps. We had these set up in the design studio this week, and many of you got a closer look at those. But especially here at the um, Sproul School for future opportunity with regards to a government building um, to possibly centralize some of those government spaces, government services. Also, we saw a lot of photos of how the field used to be used with regards to marching bands and a community space. And that seemed to be something, also looking at the size of the, the parcel, a lot of great opportunities as well. So these were actual inputs from the Monday night. Whoops, I just hit a button, Victor. Got it, <laughs> sorry, draft, okay. Um, but we had a lot of great comments on these maps. And so as many of you all saw, we had these around the room and we were kind of constantly checking them and make sure that we were headed in the right direction with the draft plan. The design studio was really fun. You all knocked it out of the park. I just could not get over the amount of folks stopping by and sort of just getting your hands on the plan. So it was really wonderful. We also had a lot of boards out front. You may have seen by the end of the week, they were getting a little dicey, but they were still out there. A couple um, smoothie drops on them and um, the rocks that were blowing them off. But um, it was just really great to just have folks stopping by and just writing down ideas about the future of Cruise Bay. So some of the favorite places, some of the top challenges, and we started to see similar ideas with regards to um, parking, walkability, circulation through town, as well as housing, public safety, providing basic needs, all very essential. Opportunities for the future. Well, there's some smoothie mark, I apologize. But um, these boards were really awesome just to have a chance. We also did, um, you know, just sort of gathering around the table like this, sharing ideas, looking at sketches, as well as we had a visit from the governor um, on Wednesday, Governor Bryan visited, as well as Lieutenant Governor Roach came to the office, came to the design studio. And we were really fortunate. Um, we, I'll tell you in just a moment, share a little bit more about the school children that visited us, but um, grateful for Ms. Nora Lease, who brought the Innovation and Technology Camp from Sproul School, and they spent a good bit of time with us in the design studio. And it was really great because that time together was not just about the plan, it was also about what we do as professionals. And so it was really great talking about architecture, engineering, planning, landscape design. So we were grateful for their time as well. But you all are shepherding some really amazing children in town. And so we went one day from Miss Pat with the Boys and Girls Club to Janae with the School of the Arts. And it was just wonderful to have children coming in and these were some of their ideas that they were writing down. And it was just so wonderful to, to look at Cruise Bay through their eyes and hear things from their mouths about their area and their, their town. So it was, if you came on Wednesday, it was, it was fun. So we had a really nice time, a little time of summer camp together. Just opportunities writing down ideas, having conversations together. And then we also had the wonderful opportunity to travel to the Senior Center. And we feel so honored that that was able to take place because the seniors in the community are so important with regards to the culture and the storytelling of St. John and continuing those stories, looking at the past and preparing for the future. So we feel so fortunate to go and spend time with our seniors. And uh, we did a little hands-on exercise with them led by Amy Groves as well as sort of looking at the maps. We took all sorts of stuff up there, maps and um, pictures and all sorts of things from the studio so that they could also participate in that process. The governor visited as well as, um, hold on, I think, okay. So um, we had great participation from the government as well as um, the community. So you don't need to hear from me. Let's take a listen to what some of the community members have been saying this week. I would like to see it cleaned up, more trees and um, better facilities for um, walking, more walkability. Well, last night experience, in my opinion, was actually very um, refreshing in the sense that the community came together to see what 
could be better done for Coos Bay and St. John in, in a whole as far as for the future generation being able to um, traverse the road, use the island that is more, um, in a most beneficial way. Um, also, it's also allowed us to see and collaborate based on the different groups, what their vision was as well, and we could also put everything together to come up with one solid plan for the island. So it gave us a little insight into different perspectives, and hopefully from those perspectives, we could come together and get something that is workable for everyone. And I was asked what I was looking for, and I said any sort of beautification of community space is, I guess, what I think of when I think about revamping the downtown of Cruz Bay. Here on St. John, it's mostly hot. It's like some showers, but not that much. And since it's mostly hot, we need some place to cool off. Because of the community. Um, and with that, um, I think we're looking to kind of bring that back together. Um, find those spaces, find those events that um, really kind of shed light and remind us why we are all really here. Oh, I remember being quaint and a little kitsch and always welcoming. Uh, my hopes are that it's done with uh, sensitivity to preservation and to the culture of the island and not, uh, how do I say this, the hopes and dreams of the people who get off of a ship from a big city to an island and hopes that it looks like a big city. It's not the idea. I hope that this works and that people do it with a sense of caring. Hello, my name is Elena and I like Mongoose Junction and one thing I would like to see in the future is better places to shop. My name is Jasmine and one thing I like about Cruise Bay is the beach. Like, uh, I like about Cruise Bay um, when I could get food. My name is Leilani, and one thing that I like about Cruise Bay is the park. Uh, my name is Leilani too, and my uh, and my favorite thing is also the park. Also the park. So, from the many ideas that we heard from the walking tour, from the Monday night time together, from the design studio, from all the feedback we've been receiving from you all, these were sort of the common themes that emerged. Um, going uh, at the forefront, culture, culture of community, culture of place, culture of space, the heritage and preservation of Cruise Bay is essential throughout all of the elements in the plan. More walkable, increased mobility, and we're gonna talk through all these in just a minute, as well as um, redevelopment of the government property for, to serve community needs, and overall create a restorative green Cruise Bay town. Okay, so here we go. This is a really important word to the evening, as I said, that we had just sort of wrapped up from the week, putting the presentation together. So this word, draft, okay? Repeat after me, so we all know, draft. Okay, thanks. I appreciate that. Okay, here we go. So the existing conditions, so what we did with this was looking at the analysis and the input, and we started to turn this into a sketch, okay? So this is an illustrative plan in this plan, we often refer to it, since it is a draft, this is more like a, a bulletin board of ideas. So the, the future elements that you see here, this is all just ideas. And so coming together from the common themes that we heard throughout the week, Amy Groves in our office worked up this plan. And basically, we're gonna talk through those five overall themes and elements, as well as how they relate to the specific areas of the plan. Now, before we jump into those, I wanna introduce my dear friend and colleague, Kurt Marsh. He's an architect, designer, and cultural bearer here on St. John, and we're honored to have him as a member of our team. He's been wonderful to work with throughout this entire process, and I uh, wanna pass it over to him. It, that's better. That's a lot better. Yeah. I didn't scare myself this time. Hi. Uh, so, yeah, this week was really exciting. Um, uh, one of the best takeaways for me was the fact that we had so much apprehension coming into this. Uh, people on St. John and in the VI were very used to plans being presented and us either responding to it positively or negatively, and most times there's no follow-up 
or adjustment. So the really exciting thing was that this was a ground up process. We started with absolutely nothing and now we have a lot. And all that we have to show is based on all the information gathered throughout the week. This workshop being open and people being able to come in and access the space and draw and sketch with us really made all the difference. Um, and so what we're presenting is the people's opinions about what they want to see their town, um, how they want to see their town change and develop. I'm going to really just preface everything else by talking about people in the space. Um, conversations I had a lot in planning rooms and um, in governments and amongst people about spaces a lot. And spaces are just empty and devoid unless people are active in them. And so we've talked a lot this week about placeness. A space without people and activity is not a place, right? So this conversation this week has been, what do we want to see in the form of uh, uh, reclaiming places, uh, spaces on St. John to create, recreate placeness in our town? So we talked a lot with some of the elders, people have re uh, re reclaimed ideas and stories about going to the battery and watching videos, uh, or movies, and when it was a drive-in space, people have talked about accessing the Cruise Bay beachfront and learning how to swim, and even fishing on Gallows Point. We've talked about how it felt just to walk through town and there were trees and shade and it was green before we started to re recreate the town to accommodate vehicles, right? And so what does accessibility look like from a historic reference, but also what does it mean to plan for the future? How do we recirculate or recreate circulation through the town so that people can be in the space? People can be in the space so that it becomes a place, right? As opposed to walking down Prince Street and a vehicle, car, a vehicle window mirror wants to clip your shoulder because it's not an actual safe space for us to travel and commute. People in the place, right? So I'm just gonna flip through a few images about an older Cruise Bay town uh, where what we experienced was a lot more uh, friendly, it was a lot warmer and welcoming. Um, it was spaces that a lot of us knew intimately, spaces that we, some of us built uh, and, and championed and cared for. Uh, if you are familiar, this is the old Lumberyard Complex, uh, which is now a parking lot. But we talk a lot about economic incentive and revitalization. The Lumberyard was full of a lot of small businesses that were built by people from St. John and on St. John. So what does it mean to conceptualize the reconstruction of a space like that to promote and encourage entrepreneurship on the ground, right? Because we've been experiencing for a few generations a lot of extractive economic uh, activity, right? Old spaces that we know and love, some of them still exist almost as they did before. C Caps is just a lot more colorful and a lot louder. <laughs> At one point in time, we didn't even have a ferry terminal, and now we've outgrown the ferry terminal. So what do we think about how we want to reposition that sort of traffic, that heavy commuter traffic? Uh, where does that new location, uh, where, where is that new location? What does that new adjusted uh, circulation through town look like? Maybe our vessels might change, because at one point we had very, a lot smaller vessels than we do now, so how do we think about maybe changing the type of vessels that we use to transport people and uh, cars and freight back and forth. What does it mean to re reintroduce more green space? We all know what this site is. This is the Grand Bay monolith, right? So what does it mean to enforce regulations? And thankfully, Cruz Bay Town is now a nationally registered historic district. And so something like Grand Bay could never happen in the Cruz Bay Town again. But what does it mean to plan for avoiding that kind of activity going forward? And so I have this like, the contemporary architect in me and the culture bearer in me is really obsessed with this image because I see a lot of potential and we'll get into some of those details as we move along. But imagine an activated Cruise Bay waterfront that stretches from well beyond Water, Water, Water site. So over at Grand Bay, come all the way around the Battery Point and then back around to the creek. 
can we imagine more green space in our town? Can we imagine this heavy ferry traffic being relocated, whether it's to the creek or down by the barge dock in Indihai? Can we imagine the battery being accessible for public use and cultural activity and facility? Can we imagine the Cruise Bay Park devoid of cars and the taxi stand and activities like the panorama or pool session playing in the park happening more frequently and without traffic and congestion? Can we imagine cars not enjoying the Cruise Bay waterfront over at the customs lot and people enjoying it instead? Can we imagine additional opportunities for small business development and entrepreneurship opportunities? Can we imagine a real manicured and, and curated space for our vendors, right? Rather than the hodgepodge tent city that we experience in the Cruise Bay town. No offense to the people that are selling things and making a living. But it could be nice. <laughs> and then the Cruise Bay, uh, the Sprout School site, uh, how can we imagine consolidating parking and government function and facility uh, all in one space? How can we imagine affordable living in the Cruise Bay town area or its periphery? Because a town without people living in it is also a town that doesn't function well for, as a place. And so, for example, draft. <laughs> all of the things I just mentioned about the Cruise Bay Park being redeveloped, uh, in, you know, in this example, we're seeing uh, uh, the extension of the park down to the waterfront, and so now we have access, pedestrian access to the Cruise Bay waterfront, whereas the taxi buses aren't sitting there enjoying that amazing view of the ocean and the sunset behind St. Thomas. Imagine we're able to walk freely up to the battery and enjoy that peninsula. It's one of two colonial structures in the Cruise Bay town, the other one being the library but it's a lot of architectural prowess that we don't get to enjoy and experience. Um, and then that's green space sort of wrapping around back over to the customs lot where we've moved some of the parking um, off of the waterfront. This plan sort of seeks to add space for um, vendors and kiosks and things like that, but then we repurpose all of this waterfront space and it starts to look a lot like a Cruise Bay town of 50 years ago where there were minimal buildings and lots of green, and to the young lady's point, shade, places to cool off. But also, how do we reroute traffic throughout the town space? And then in the larger plan, how do all of those traffic networks all start to work together so that as we move through the space, it's much more efficient and effective? Great, appreciate it. This was a, a picture of the Boys and Girls Club um, taking a walk from the church down to the park, and it was just really wonderful to see them going by our studio, and then the next day they stopped in, and we got to spend some good time together. So the next common theme that we heard was walkable, and I'd like to introduce Victor Dover with our firm Dover Cullen Partners, and he's going to walk you through some of those concepts. The two most beautiful words in the English language are what if. So all of this is what if. But I have to say, before I talk about walkability just for a second that to say thank you to those of you who welcomed us this week because how many of us can say that week to week what we do for a living it can be a deeply moving experience and it has been for all of us a, a deeply moving experience on a, on a soul level and thank you for that well for 3,500 years or so human beings have been coming together in towns and villages for all sorts of reasons, you know, for commerce and for security and because we're social beings, so we want to be together with others. Uh, we make all of our cultural and economic exchanges in towns and villages. But the design of those towns and villages begins with the design of streets. So while we're in a moment, we're going to talk about some very big picture ideas. I want to talk about a detail, which is that there, many of you said the phrase, and you heard some of it on the video, walkability walkability. What we've begun to try to do on these maps and with some of the images we'll show you is isolate locations which seem to be the highest priority for improving the walkable streets. Now that's not to the exclusion of making them work for everything else like deliveries or pickups and drop-offs or for protection from fire or collecting garbage or a moving van. All of those things 
are part of it as well. But when we start with the people on two feet or on two wheels side by side if they're in a wheelchair, um, if we start with the people and we design around the requirements that humans have for walkable streets, and then we accommodate all those other things as necessary and to the right extent, we end up with a balanced street scene. So what makes a street walkable? Well, there are a few things. Uh, first, when the speeds are slow of all the other users of these shared spaces, like cars, or when the dominant species in that space is the human being, and the motorist or the car and their car, those are guests in that space. Slow speeds. That's the f most important thing to get safety. And of course, we all know if somebody is tearing down Vestergata, they're much more uh, terrifying, much more fear-inducing, and a bit more dangerous than if someone is moving slowly down that same street. So speeds slow, human paced. Next, we crave locations that have shade for the reasons the young lady mentioned in the video. It's hot, and shade matters a lot. So look at a street like Prince Street where there is a little bit of shade. I think Myra and, and Ralph, I told you earlier this week, those may be the three most important trees in Cruz Bay Town, at least on Prince Street. And when a street is uh, safer and slower and shaded, and when it has a sense of people being the dominant, that means there are probably doors and windows and storefronts and balconies facing streets, not blank walls, uh, not garage doors, things like that. That's what makes us like a place more. So we begin to think, what if? Now, we started with Prince Street because it was pointed to by so many of you on your maps as the place to start a new era of pedestrians come first. And I looked at this and I said, well, let's, let's start with this. So first, what if? You want to see that again, administrator? There's, this is, a, this is, a, this is, this is the, the, the first slide in a 10-year backlog of public improvements existing. Before and after, pretty subtle, but it can make a lot of difference. And of course, we get the lights back on a lot sooner after a storm when the power lines are underground. But that wouldn't by itself create a walkable street, would it? You know, the next thing is, what if the street itself is made as a pedestrian space that from time to time we let cars come share on a controlled basis? Maybe at times this is even a pedestrian-only street as it has been in the past. So here's a version of that where it's just quickly illustrated storyboard style like a curbless street uh, that, I mean, with a texture on the pavement so it doesn't look like a highway. And then you begin to realize that it's still, there's still more to do because the rest of that ensemble, slow, shaded, safe, and eyes on the street comes from buildings. And when you make streets as more than just transportation con conveyance, they can be great addresses. So I said, well, in the fullness of time, it will become obvious that infill development and redevelopment on these great addresses should occur. There's one example, which would be pretty incredible because you'd step off the pier and look up the hill and you would see it. Um, so um, there you go. Megan, you can get your logo up there, maybe. So, these what ifs are just to get you thinking about the possibilities of reimagining the public spaces. So uh, Robin Crowder and I looked together at Fish Fry Drive also. And Robin, do you, can you grab a mic? Because um, I'm going to put you on the spot here in a second. So we, we saw this space and we watched it operate at all times of day this week and on different days of the week and times when the ferry had just arrived and the trucks just came off the, from the barge dock and at times when it was quieter. And uh, this seemed like one of those places you identified on the maps Monday night as a good place to start. Uh, it's wild and not very green, pretty gray. A lot of pavement, not a lot of softness here. And of course, very little shade. And when they get barreling down the street, they get going pretty fast. So we started on a chalkboard with, well, what if as we anticipate the redevelopment of the school site, we anticipate the redevelopment of the community center uh, and uh, infill development on what is now the parking lot next to the tennis courts and 
a reimagining of the fire station. You see all these ingredients that go along that frontage of Fish Fry Drive? Here's a version, the starter version, that has right-sized travel lanes, not, really, not big wide ones that are make an invitation to higher speeds, and room now for proper sidewalks on both sides, and with a minimal right-of-way, you can even get a, street, a line of street trees in that. Uh, Robin examined it several ways, including one version that has street trees on one side, and another version that has street trees on both sides. Uh, but if in this, in this view you're kind of looking up the hill and there's the concession stand from the old ballpark and the annex beyond. And these buildings on either side are imaginings about what might come in place of today's fire station and along the redevelopment of the, of the center. I'm, now, now to put you on the spot, Robin, uh, what was most important to you when you were looking at this? Robin good Cross. evening, everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces in the room. Um, as you've heard tonight and as we've been here this week, uh, one of the things that's come up is walkability and the desire to have a better walking experience. And so the number one thing uh, when it came to designing this was creating a more pleasurable walking experience. And this design isn't just applicable for fish fry drive. Like you can plug and play where necessary, but the number one thing that makes this street safer is the tree line. And so by creating a generous sidewalk and a protected tree line that will protect you from traffic and also from shade was the number one thing when coming up with this design. Thanks everybody. Thanks Robin. Next I'd like to welcome John Ford to walk through some, walk through some of the mobility concepts that are in the plan. All right, thank you, Margaret. Good evening, everyone. So I, I wanted to say before I jump in, um, really echo some of my colleagues and my friends here on the team in saying how much we appreciated everyone that, that showed up. We loved being with you in this place this week uh, and hearing your stories. It's really true, we didn't come with designs in our pocket. We are here as translators of the vision um, and we're honored to be here with you uh, in doing it. And I wanna say before I forget, I'm a civil engineer, are you interested in civil? Heard about engineering? I'm not sure. Not sure? All right, well let's make sure to talk. Don't leave tonight <laughs> before we're done. Um, so mobility and getting around, getting around within Cruise Bay Town, getting to Cruise Bay Town and out of town um, is, is a challenge and an opportunity. So we heard about walkability, walkable streets, or other ways of getting around town. If you're in a vehicle, if you're on your two feet, a wheelchair, and ferries. Um, and really, when we looked this week and heard from you all about, about different places that could use some improvement, some of the themes and the vision of being feeling safer, having places, as Kurt has talked about, where you can better connect to each other and to culture and context, um, we started looking at different kind of pieces of the vision and understanding we're not going to do this all at once together. We're going to have a series of steps. We're going to try things and see how they work and how they fit. And so we identified some of those pieces within the overall kind of first pass at a connected loop, that there are pieces to that. There's the, the downtown there in yellow uh, that Kurt showed a first pass at. There's the historic loop that could extend. Um, we talked a lot about connections to the beach and Strand Gate. We talked a lot about connections um, through the circle and could the circle itself become greener. Um, we talked about connections down the hill as you looked at Robin's sketches and drawings down to a, a future community park in the car ferry dock. Also connections, if we start, as, as Kurt has mentioned, those cars are enjoying a, a great view of the waterfront. If those are places for people, can the street transform as we move forward as well to be more walkable, green, connect more ahead to Mongoose and to Parks Welcome? So Ellen on our team, landscape architect, did a series of sketches to say, Kurt showed kind of a, an end view. It's gonna take some years maybe to get to that end view point, but you could start really small and build on what is already happening for festivals where Prince Street uh, and the waterfront closed to vehicles and open to people temporarily. Could that be built upon a little bit with some infrastructure investments to maybe do a little bit of what Victor showed to pedestrianize 
Prince Street, and we say that really um, prioritizing people walking um, through the area and that vehicles can still get through, still get to the church, trash pickup and all that can happen, but there's a way to have pedestrian first and you're, you're meant to be there walking and feeling safe. Could be with an expanded arrivals area at the ferry and maybe just a little bit of a, a hint of a connection, welcoming connection to the battery and the beach. This doesn't even have to be the first step. Maybe there are planter boxes that could be um, a better and easy way to pedestrianize Prince Street, maybe try different places to um, make pedestrian only for an evening or on weekends and, and build on that. That could build to an in-between step where that expanded arrivals area, we still have vehicles moving through, but there is a reorganization of the taxi and pickup drop-off so that there is a layer there that's expanding the connection to the beach and the pedestrian zone. Maybe that happens in conjunction with kind of a reorganization of the taxi drop-off zone if that were to move over here and have a place that's really not, not a far walk, line of sight, but it's out of the way of that kind of primary park zone that we heard so much about and experienced ourselves. And we're gonna show in a few minutes a connection to the battery. We love that idea that we heard um, this week about a, a way to have a, a walk around the battery. And then this is the drawing that Kurt showed that, that maybe this is the vision, this is the future, and as we take small steps, they're in line with getting here. So draft, we'd love to hear what you think. The big step here is if the clinic were to move out of the flood zone, this sure would make a nice expansion of public space to connect with each other and back to the history um, and context of what makes Cruise Bay so special. Few key trail connections we heard about and kind of saw as we were walking around for the week. Potential for a path to connect around the back of Small Pond so that from the car ferry dock, maybe the market, you can find your way around to town without going over the hill and also have a nice kind of nature walk connection or boardwalk. Potential for a stair, especially as the community park is re-envisioned and becomes a space, um, uh, and as it is now for gathering, that you could have a path up to the library through the steps next to the DPNR building. As the school site is re-envisioned, are there ways, especially for folks walking from the market and from the park, to connect through the school site to not have to go up and down and experience kind of a re-envisioned site through that community space and feel like, oh, that maybe this doesn't feel like as long or a hot of a walk because it's interesting and I see people along the way and it's green and cool. And then the Battery Nature Trail, which we went out there and did some reconnaissance. We didn't quite feel like we're supposed to be there. Um, so are there ways to do just a little bit of uh, reimagining and investment to have a welcoming path to what some of the most beautiful landscape in town. So Ellen on our team did this sketch just to say we don't have to be super expensive with it um, or complicated. We can respect the existing green coastline and the mangroves and, and have a path that kind of winds around with overlook points and connecting maybe to some of that first phase walkability and placemaking improvements that connect back to the culture of, of Cruise Bay Town. So, parking. Getting in and out of Cruise Bay Town is an unpredictable experience and a challenge. And there's only so much space if we're talking about making the space we have work to accommodate so many things. Parking is one of them. Rearranging some of the pieces or maybe rethinking some of the pieces we think is an opportunity with this plan because it touches so many things from stormwater flooding, uh, possible re-envisioning and imagining of the government sites so that if we're serious about reimagining some of the parking that's on the waterfront and having a clear connection for people, can we find places within redevelopment of some of the government property to accommodate public parking?
So I'll point out a few of those places, the school site for sure. We have schemes and we'll get into them in a few minutes where there could be a, a layer of parking underneath a field uh, or buildings. The same with the BMV site could accommodate more parking and a re-envisioning of the lumber yard and government property could start to say, well, we have convenient parking that's now much more easily walkable from place to place and accomplishes some of the other pieces of the vision that we've, we've heard from you all. And one last thought on mobility. We know the walkability group had, had quite a bit of momentum. Um, could we layer on top of that re-envisioning and, and moving pieces around a shuttle? A hop on, hop off shuttle that could connect. This is the green line here from the market, loop around through. Uh, oh, and I should mention these pink really are the civic, civic sites as they exist now and possibly could in the future. So the whole mobility framework, making sure to connect up those important places to you all. So that shuttle could connect through down to uh, the ferry docks, the creek, loop around and come back. And last but not least, the ferry charter uh, private vessel car ferry situation. Um, I don't think I heard from anybody that said the ferry waterfront situation is working perfect right now. Let's keep it. So we looked at the pieces. This is existing conditions where these symbols um, at the passenger ferry, private vessels, the taxi and drop off at the creek. We have the ambulance boat, Coast Guard, um, customs building, of course, private charters in the National Park Dock and the car ferry dock with parking at the gravel lot. This is going to take a lot of analysis and work from all of us together. We put a couple of alternatives together, draft, but start to move those pieces around and see how they might interlock with other things in the plan, like the government building, uh, the government site redevelopment, and walkability improvements. Here's one strategy, potential ferry strategy one, draft potential. What if, Victor's favorite words, the passenger ferry were to switch places with the customs and coast guard operations. So those flip back and, and forth. Passenger ferry goes here, customs take its place. The customs building uh, reorient to be a passenger terminal. And as we had shown in a few previous sketches, the, the car the taxi drop off can kind of move with it, which helps to open up that pedestrian uh, priority space. Also possibility for car uh, pickup and taxis as part of the school site redevelopment, which is a short walk down a reimagined Prince. One option, another option. And we understand there's a lot of congestion when 250 or 300 people come off the passenger ferry to Prince Street in the park. But we also had a feeling that that, and historically has been uh, in, in port towns, a burst of energy that arrives right in the heart of this place and the, the heart of the culture of this place. And so if we were to work to improve the experience upon passenger ferry arrival where it is now, how could that work? What would that feel like so it's less congested, less stressful? So if the passenger ferry were to stay there with an expanded dock, pedestrian improvements, taxi pickup uh, and drop off either shifted a block or two away, in conjunction with an expanded car ferry dock that could perhaps include some passenger ferry arrivals, maybe they alternate, could re-envision over time whether there's the possibility for different vessels that accommodate people and cars. And so there are trade-offs here for sure, um, not the least of which would be the expansion of this dock, which we understand is it, it can't handle all of that now. So there would be environmental impacts to expand the dock where there are the mangroves. It's a po possibility for um, green restoration now. 
So expanding the dock would be a, a step in the other direction. Food for thought that we'll continue to work through together. Uh, the last thing we looked at in terms of mobility and parking, and parking in town, and Victor did a sketch that did his best here in pink to outline places cars could park. And it's scattered, as you know, and it's unpredictable. And there aren't many places here that are obviously and definitely public parking. And so we started to think that if, say, some of that key parking that's really stressful to get a spot there, if that were to be kind of become pedestrian priority, we started counting spaces to say, what, here's what the impact would be. If those spaces change to a better use per your vision on the waterfront, can we replace them and more with projects that are kind of one layer away, convenient to get to, predictable, under the field, perhaps, uh, part of the BMV redevelopment. With that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Nate Kelly. Thank you, John. Good evening, everybody. One of the issues that drove this from the start was a large amount of government property when we do these exercises, we are often not faced with that, and that's an opportunity. When Ian said in the beginning he was going to manage your expectations, and he sort of like, you know, brought you all down a little bit, I'll maybe bring you back up a little bit, because having a lot of government property is an opportunity. How to get things done? Development here is challenging. Costs are super high. And when government owns a fair amount of the property, then they become a potential valuable partner in reducing some of those costs and raising some of those opportunities. So it was really important for us to take a look at that as we went into this particular exercise. So you get a look here at that base map that we put together. These areas in tan represent all of the government holdings. And we didn't do a detailed assessment of all of these, but I'll take you through a couple of key places this evening, again, to think what if. What, what, what could we envision for some of these key opportunity sites that would plug into the walkability issue, the transportation issues, and really enhance that experience? Why, how did we hear about this this week? What were the questions that were asked? Or what were some of the, the issues that were raised high on the list with almost everybody with whom I spoke how can we reduce trips to St. Thomas for basic services? It's just not convenient. Really, some people are doing their grocery shopping sometimes in St. Thomas. People are going to get their senior cards sometimes because they can't fit the schedule and make that work. Whatever it may be, there are too many trips for you all as residents and business owners to have to go deliver things, to have to go pick things up, to have to go see doctors, whatever that may be. When we're looking at these government sites, can we start to answer that question in a productive way? What's going to happen here? What's going to happen at the school site? How does that figure into the equation? And the annex site and the fire station, these are all really key locations. And you saw some of those in the diagrams that Victor and John were talking about. They're really important to people getting around in a more effective and enjoyable and safe way in the community. And can the clinic be relocated within this? You saw those park sketches, and a few of you were saying, well, wait a minute, there's, a, there's an important building right there um, for this community. Let's take a look at where you know, some of the opportunities may be. So that links to a different waterfront experience as well. So here we are at the school site, and we had um, Kenneth in our studio today and all week, um, looking at this and thinking of the different possibilities um, that could occur here. And here are just some sort of two-dimensional, we call them plan view sketches. We heard a lot about, again, the history of this site. And again, those stories that we've been talking about that came into our studio and that we had at the tables here. And the baseball field was just something that was really special to people in their memory. You used to be able to go, sit in the stands, Take in a game, sit with your friends, pass the time, watch the kids, you know, just really um, a, a great opportunity. It wasn't just baseball. 
you know, the high school marching band, all the, uh, the, march, the school marching band, you know, all kinds of activities on that particular field. So we felt it was important to sort of, you know, again, what if? What if we brought that back? What would that look like? But think about the opportunities around the field and enhancing those to maybe provide some of these government services that we've been thinking about. Could we put the post office and a clinic and some other items up here that sort of centralizes this not only into a recreational space, but a civic space as well? To the right, sort of a different idea, a different what if, the parking situation. So John showed you some actual back of the envelope math that we did. We could take away about 90 spaces along the waterfront, but we could probably add almost you know, 150, 200 here, depending on the development concept that we do. And it wouldn't just be a big old parking lot in the middle of the community. It would actually have a lot of development opportunity, some green space. This is an enormous site. This site is a potential game changer for your community. So we want to be thoughtful and think about the different trade-offs and opportunities that we have going forward. So again, the ball field, maybe a reconfigured roundabout up top. The community center might be across the street. Um, so really, you know, different elements that could come together for something that's pretty special. So here's what we see today. Here's our existing conditions. Um, we are right there on the corner right now as we speak. And then this is maybe what that ball field might look like as we go forward. So it's really amazing, again, to think of that amenity coming back. But look at all the development potential around, aligned around this and the activity that brings. So this is not a space that goes to sleep when the baseball field is not being used for something. This is something that really could be you know, activated at all hours and speak to Again, something that was a part of this community many years ago. We would have the annex site developed as well, a community center here down on the left. So there's a lot happening here um, that could really, um, again, be a game changer for this community. Restored ball field, greening with street trees, field side shops. This is one way to think about the roundabout that may um, help with the traffic flow through that area. There's a lot of trucks, you know, things have to move through there, uh, but there's a way potentially to do it safe, more safely than you have today and in a more welcome fashion. Here's a different concept. So you see the same space. This does not have the ball field. So again, we think about trade-offs. With, with the ball field, we get sort of one direction of how things could happen. With this particular direction, this is more focused on the amenity of parking. We still have some great green space in here. This is up against where the roundabout is now. Two levels could provide an enormous amount of parking, free up the development potential. That's one thing that hasn't come up in the discussion tonight. When you saw that particular graphic with all the pink parking areas, most of those are small private parking areas. And if something like this gets built, what do those property owners start to think? Well, I've, maybe I've got an opportunity. Maybe I don't need that parking lot anymore. Maybe I could build something of more value, maybe a little bit of housing, you know, what, you know, something that could be folded in here. That's another important aspect of this is some attainable housing could also be folded into here. There's a lot of development potential. There's a lot of space that could be made in the type of place that Kurt was talking about earlier. So one last concept here, something a little bit with a different configuration. Um, the, probably one of the bigger items here is that the green space has moved off where there was a rotary, which is now turned into a, a larger intersection where some of the streets been reclaimed for public space in front of those buildings. And the green space has moved to the other corner. And I do want to ask my colleague, Kenneth, to just talk a little bit about what you were thinking about these spaces when you're putting together, Kenneth. Hello? Oh. There's just a delay. Um, I think some of the things we're looking at is that 
uh, there's a lot of elements here that, that can be interchangeable. It's not just three scenarios. We, we picked these three as illustrative examples, but um, they, you know, there's, there's elements here that you, you could pick and choose uh, different elements. This one, for example, has a parking underneath, one level of parking underneath those buildings in, in the courtyard. Um, that would potentially be a more expensive way to do the parking, but would free up more land for uh, development and for green space. So, you know, there's, there's uh, pluses and minuses with all of these. Uh, so we're very interested to hear uh, what your opinions are on these. Yeah, thanks, Kev. And so, just some of the labels there. And we wanna move on to one other sort of nodal point in this area. And this is an interesting layering. So you're looking in, in the creek here, um, looking at the Port Authority property in the foreground, and then government property across the street, sort of the vendor's plaza there. And then you go up, as many of you know, um, to the lumber yard. Uh, where we have surface parking today. So this is an interesting sort of arrangement here where you have you know, sort of three different key owners interplay between private property and publicly owned property with important interface with the water. So there's a lot happening here. And then of course this street corridor right down the center is really the only um, connection for people you know, who want to head down to Mongoose Junction, go to the Park Service Welcome Center, all of those things. This is heavily traveled by pedestrians today without a lot of pedestrian infrastructure. So the demand is there. This is a very busy spot with a lot of interesting opportunities. So some of the things that Eric in our studio thought about today um, was, um, oh, excuse me, I'll go back. Um, you can see to the right, that's sort of a two-dimensional looking down on the site. Um, but this shows sort of a rethought um, circulation and development concept. So in the foreground, um, what looks like a park, interestingly enough, is the street. Um, so redesigning streets as a shared public space with boulevard features perhaps and trees. You see this from a distance and you, you were scratching your head. Is that a park? Is that a street? Well, that's the point, right, is that we are blending these spaces, but designing them carefully to be safe so everybody knows where they need to be, but just turning it into a very different experience than what you have today. Next layer in from there, you have some underground, not underground, some ground level parking underneath um, vendors plazas or within vendors plazas. Um, so that whole area gets repurposed and you can see up the center a staircase that brings us higher into this area. So this all gets built into the uh, natural topography that you have there, but becomes a completely different experience based on the street, where the parking is located, sort of out of sight. It's also floodable, by the way. So in case there is a serious storm situation here, that ground floor area is floodable. And then you move up into the private property area. And of course, we can't control what's gonna happen with the lumber yard, but perhaps we can inspire, right? And show these types of visions and maybe, you know, spur some thinking about a way to really connect these sites together, to really knit them together um, in a way that's cohesive and makes these sort of three disconnected spaces one unified place where people can enjoy and experience a new St. John that harkens to a former time. So again, local vendor stalls, parking, a walkable street, perhaps a new fish market there. I know there's already some plans to think about that. This could be a more robust facility for that. Some office space, affordable housing, um, really quite a mix and a lot of opportunity um, in this area. Um, and I do wanna take a moment just to give Eric a chance to talk about like how this would all maybe come together over time. Yeah, sure. So looking at the site, the, um, I think one of the main ideas here is kind of identifying strategic opportunities for public in investment, for public resources to um, be um, incorporated into this site in a way that, that supports the surrounding parcels and in particular the, the lumberyard parcel um, 
you know, it all kind of builds off of each other. You know, and it's, it's a successional level of, of investment that, um, you know, the, the public sector takes the first step and then builds a, a foundation for uh, additional investment into the future. Thanks, Eric. And just as sort of a, a, a running punch list of things, some things that we thought about that I just want to make sure, you know, we're keeping track of and we're thinking of in our mind about certain opportunities as it relates to government properties, as it relates to services. Things we heard from you all is that this idea of wayfinding and like knowing where to go. You have a lot of visitors here who come for the first time or the second time and just aren't sure where to go and that creates you know, some of the chaos that you have down um, by the ferry area. And you have important destinations here, whether it's the library or whether it's going to be whatever occurs on this site or if it's the National Park or if it's Mongoose Junction. People should know where they're going and organizing both cars and people, you know, on their feet. The evacuation routes, clearly an important thing to have on the ground with a system of signage. Trash and recycling, bottle filling stations, composting, lighting, solar operated amenities, public restrooms, these are all things that you brought to the table that we're thinking about as we put these designs together. So I will stop there and we heading back to you, John. Okay, thank you, Nate, I'm back. Um, green, we heard so much about being cooler, greener, um, healthier, and I like the creative restorative green town. That feels to me like a return to what you all picture in your minds as the, the healthy version of, of St. John and Cruz Bay town. Uh, before it was kind of changed, it was um, paved, there was more vehicles. Um, this restorative green to me is a, a connection back to your cultural uh, and, and historical connections. So we took a look at the existing green as a place to start, of course. Um, and as everything you heard about this evening could plug in at various times and per perhaps in different ways, but looking at the overall vision, and being clear about where those pieces could accommodate more green infrastructure. Trees are the original green infrastructure. So could every project have a way to be greener so that Cruz Bay Town is more like a sponge? And so adding that green network in bit by bit um, and carefully and, and realistically so that everything we do is taking a step towards uh, being less gray and more green and all the benefits that come with it uh, and what we heard from you. We looked as engineers, planners, landscape architects at the lay of the land. You know this very well, um, but understanding the unique topography and where, uh, when a drop of rain falls, where it ends up. And it's not surprising when you look at the watershed divides um, here, the high points, and where water flows when it falls to, to some of the locations where it collects and adds are where we heard a lot about flooding. Um, so when it rains more than an inch or two, a couple inches, you, know, you can't get around down by the gravel lot. So if we, with our green infrastructure, can have a sponge that catches as much of that precipitation as possible before it gets down there to reduce flooding rather than dealing with it all at the end of the pipe, while also providing all of those benefits that trees can provide. Um, that, again, that's a piece of, that's a small pieces um, and small projects that add up over time, and they have so many benefits. So the lay of the land was, was critically important to us to address flooding um, before the water gets there. We have a, no a number of tools to do that, and they're not super complicated, so when we plant trees, can they have a system below where there's a matrix and there's enough soil that the, the roots don't just get as you know, stifled over time, that they have a place to grow so they grow up to be their best selves and maybe even accept stormwater runoff into that root system from the street. Can there be chambers underneath parking? Or maybe if there's pla places underneath the streets 
that when it rains, uh, stormwater runoff goes under the parking into those chambers, possibly could be filtered and reused, could go into the ground. This is infrastructure um, that maybe there are grants that could be helping to fund some of these improvements as resiliency projects while also supporting things like additional parking. And everywhere within town can pavement, say they're pedestrian uh, oriented streets that have pavers. Can the joints between those pavers be stone instead of grout so that when it rains, it goes right in the ground? So I wanted to uh, ask my colleague, Ellen, who's a landscape architect on our team to see if she can find her way to a mic. I wanted to ask her, uh, she's done a lot of work on these plans and pulled them together. Is there kind of a rhyme or reason to where those different practices go? Um, everything's located where there's um, several opportunities. So uh, John pointed out, we looked at where the water was going to. Um, so where there are those locations outside of the floodplain where we have an opportunity to catch a lot of it to help it filter back into the ground. Um, also places that'll be providing dual purposes. So we've heard it's hot and <laughs> we've felt that it's hot. So places where we can feed shade and trees so that it'll improve the streetscape along with the pavers, not just providing an opportunity to let water sink through, but also improve the pedestrian realm for that walkability purpose. Excellent. Thanks, Ellen. Here are examples. It's not a one size fits all. Are there ways that here in Cruise Bay Town you can look to your past? Uh, maybe when you build an extension to Prince Street Plaza or Ferry Dock that it's made to, it's selected by local artists and artisans. It feels of Cruise Bay Town um, and not a bunch of stones that were built in a, um, a factory somewhere else. Can small scale pavement be removed and allow grass to grow up through it? Um, are there kind of stone solutions or, or boardwalks we heard a lot about and even pavement can be built to be porous so that rainfall falls on it and goes right down to the ground. You can see rain ponding on typical pavement and porous pavement just, again, Cruise Bay Town is a sponge. We call it lovable infrastructure. So these are some of the things that we heard over the week, um, making sure we're prepared, healthy, and connected and using infrastructure and green to help achieve those goals and many more. Great. Thank you, John. I know that was a lot to take in with our five common themes that have emerged this week. And I know you all are going to have a lot of uh, the need for a lot of time to sort of continue to digest these ideas. And so that's why once again, in draft form, but we thought tonight, we could at least just take a quick poll. We're going to have time afterwards to have some conversation and to continue the community dialogue about these core ideas as well as possible um, redevelopment opportunities as well as just sort of overall concepts throughout Cruise Bay Town. I think one of the most exciting things going is by being one of the few National Historic Districts in the Virgin Islands. That's an incredible gift, not just for preserving culture, but also protecting the future. So you're preserving what's already here, but also protecting into the future what can be built. So just keeping that in mind as well. But here we go. If you want to, um, this should be already set up from earlier, but in case anyone needs the directions, if you can text to the number 22333, the word Dover Cole 516. But if you've already done it earlier, you're good to go. Okay, so here we go. Now, when you answer this question, your word or your comments are going to come up on the screen. Just a heads up. But we want to hear from you. So which ideas discussed tonight are most important to you? We covered a lot from government properties to walkability, mobility, green, redevelopment, preservation, culture. So many opportunities and so many ways to conserve and protect and um, all right we got walkability community spaces
especially in Cruz Bay Town, I think it's interesting looking at the community spaces also as the streets are part of that as well. Oh, okay, so this is generating a list, isn't it? My apologies. Okay, it's generating a list for us, right? Okay, so it's not adding, t it's adding to, but it's going directly into an Excel file right now. So thank you all for that. I thought it was making a word cloud, but it's not. <laughs> yes, if if you yes, if you write it into your phone and hit send, it'll come up onto the screen. And if you already did that, it's likely a little bit further down in the list, but we're recording all of your answers. And like we said earlier, this input's really helpful to us. There'll still be times, um, plenty of time available on the um, Love City Strong website to continue to review the plans, but just for some immediate feedback tonight as we wrap up the Shred Week, this is really helpful for us as well. What are the stars? It's like a bullet. Yeah, I don't think the stars are. That's right. You can just type in a word. You don't have to type in A, B, C, or D on this one. You can just type in a word, and it'll pop right up here on the screen. Hey, that's. As you can tell, we like feedback. We like to circle back and make sure that, that we're headed in the right direction. Are we ready for the next question? All right, let's go. Are there any issues not discussed tonight that you want Love City Strong to consider? We also have some paper feedback forms at the sign-in table, and that's also a great way if you think of more ideas after this evening to continue to write those down and, and get those to us. That's always a good one. These are very helpful. Thank you all. All right. Last question. Everyone good? Anyone still typing? All right, one more question. Based on what you heard tonight, do you think the work so far is on the right track? So this one 
if you, um, if yes, you would type in A and hit send. If probably yes, need more information, you would type in B. Or no, you would type in C. We went through a lot of information tonight, and even for us as planners, we're still um, reviewing a lot of the details and making sure we get the details right. So that's why it's so important, once again, with a work in progress presentation, that there'll still be plenty of opportunity to sort of dive a little bit more into some of the details and make sure that we're getting it right. Yes, probably yes. Few knows. All right. Thank you all for the feedback. We appreciate it. So, what's happening next? Um, from this evening, we'll have the presentation available on the Love City Strong website. You could take a closer look at the images. We'll also, at that point, what we would like to do is also do a more detailed sort of question and answer survey about the illustrations that we showed so that we can sort of talk a little bit more, um, getting your feedback on those various design concepts. Refinements, that would be our next task as planners. After we get a good night's sleep, we're going to... Um, get some feedback and uh, start to refine drawings and continue to work together until we get it right. So we appreciate you all continuing to participate in the process. Um, as well as, as we're refining those things and keeping up to date through the Love City Strong website, there will be a summary report and a community update meeting in the fall of 2023. And at that time, we'll also be looking at some action steps, next steps, and implementation strategies that can answer some of those questions with regards to prioritization and funding and community public-private partnerships. So those are some of the things that we're gonna be working towards in the coming weeks and months. Our work is not done, but we're grateful for you all as a community to allow us to be a part of this important process and this important plan to shape a vision for the future. I'd like to wrap up this evening with um, Ian, if you'd like to say a few words as we close. and. Um, once again, thank you all so much for welcoming us to your home. We very much appreciate it, and you have the most beautiful island in the territory. Thank you so much, Margaret. Let's give them a round of applause. Um, you know, as you can see, we covered a lot of information this week. This is just the beginning. Um, you know, Love City Strong is committed um, to being an advocate for the community of St. John. Um, it started out with disaster preparedness, and you know, then through that we started fixing homes, and now we're doing plans. <laughs> uh, it's it's tried quite the progression. I um, want to thank Mr. Fields for coming by, Nigel, uh, our National Park Superintendent. Thank you for coming. Also, you know, none of this could be possible without our very own Kurt Marsh. Um, you know, it is, um, as Kurt being a part of my family, I remember um, like right out of when I graduated from college, I remember when he was beginning his journey to become an architect and the family was talking about how we were going to get him to school. I wasn't really involved, but I heard. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I wanted to come to me talking about what the hell are you talking about, but... Um, you know, it's to see that and to see him engaged this week as a young architect with something that can help to, to showcase his passion for this island. And that passion is what caused him to do go into architecture. And I know that because I speak to him all the time. And so whatever your passion is, dig into it. And let's make St. John what it can really be if we just work together. Everybody that is here came, well, you know, some of us didn't have a choice, we were born, but you came because something attracted you to this island. 
So, you know, we, we look at the properties and everything and fix them up, but I want to make sure that we don't lose sight of our people. Because the property is just the property, like they said, until we step into it. Right? Just like the Michael Jordan movie, right? The shoe is just the shoe until the person steps into the shoe. So we are the people, we are the ones that are going to occupy these spaces when they are built. But again, just to level expectations, this is not a plan that's going to be developed next week. This is just a roadmap for us as a community to understand what the potential is and give us an idea that if something comes up, let's start working on making it a reality. So I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Again, I really appreciate everyone taking the time out because this is a reflection of us as a community. And um, we have a lot of decisions to make moving forward. And let's use this platform and use this spirit to come together to make the decisions that not just impact us, but will impact our future generations. So thank you again. Have a good night. And uh, look forward to working together to make... Cruise Bay, a better place.